Hello, guys. Welcome to the channel. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, he doesn't need an introduction, um, so I will put him in frame right away. Uh, his name is Jurgen Apello, and uh, welcome, Jurgen. How are you? Hey, hello. I'm very good. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for being in the channel. So, Jurgen, could you explain to the audience um, who is Jurgen Apello, probably in two or three minutes? Well, um, originally I am a software engineer. I studied at the University in Delft in the Netherlands, which means I'm Dutch. I live in Rotterdam and um, I haven't written a single line of code in I think about 10, 12 years because I have broader interests than just uh, software engineering and programming. I like marketing, I like management and leadership stuff, I like finance i like lots of things so uh, my broad interests have brought me to writing books on management and leadership topics in the agile community and uh, i am sort of famous quote unquote for the uh, management 3.0 book which was my first one that i wrote uh, 12 years ago and uh, since then i wrote a couple more uh, managing for happiness uh, how to change the world and uh, yeah that's uh, that's basically what i am known for as a writer and a speaker at conferences uh, as well there were not many conferences to be honest in the last two years <laughs> mostly webinars online of course but thankfully they're coming back so i look forward to uh, to traveling again awesome so he's the author of some of these books how to change the world como cambiar el mundo in spanish managing for happiness which is pretty awesome book, in my opinion, with all the drawings and very straightforward. And then he also has this one. Well, start up, scale up, screw up. Okay. So I have some of your books over here. I really, I have really enjoyed them. Um, Jurgen, could you explain? I saw in your LinkedIn that you named yourself Creator Networker. I know why, because I have seen all of most of your videos. But could you explain to the audience or could you explain it? Let's say to a 10 year old kid, how would you explain that to, to a very young kid? Oh, good question. Um, so the term that has been quite popular in the last uh, few decades is knowledge worker. And it's, this name is still being uh, used by many people, which sort of suggests that you need to know a lot of stuff, that you need to become an expert or a knowledgeable person about something in order to have a career, in order to make money, uh, have good jobs, etc. And I think that's not really the case anymore. Um, uh, the knowledge in our heads is less important than the other knowledge out there on the internet, in the heads of our friends and families and contacts, uh, etc. So what we should be doing is do uh, networking online, offline, but most of it happens online nowadays, interact with a lot of people, learn from them, and then be creative, create our own knowledge, create our own experiences. So that's why I started calling myself creative networker, because it's not about being a knowledge worker. It's it's not like, let me try and learn as much as possible and then exploit the knowledge in my head. No, the real talent is creating new stuff, new things that did not exist before with the knowledge that you're able to find in your network. Um, so, yeah, uh, I see the creative networker as sort of the follow up to the knowledge worker. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what would be your relationship nowadays with management 3.0? Are you still in charge? Is there a management 4.0 in the way? So um, I have been working on that for seven years, I think, seven, eight years. And uh, then I wanted to do something else. So um, I, I sold the company. I still have a few shares. So officially, I'm sh still a shareholder. Um, and uh, I, I earned some royalties because of the courseware that is uh, being used by the Management Theater team. Uh, so I am still sort of 
involved uh, 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 sideways as the as the original creator of the materials, but I'm not involved in the team at, at this moment. They do a great job. They had they went much further uh, since then since since I left, and they created new content and new events, etc. Well, I focused on, on other things. And uh, I am someone who likes to experiment. I like trying new things. Uh, I get bored when I do the same thing again and again and again. I find that not very interesting. Uh, other people are really good at that. They are really good at scaling something up. As I, as I always say, I like going from zero to one. That's my challenge. And other people are really good at going from one to 1,000. <laughs> That's not my that's not my talent. I, I you should not hire me for scaling things up. I'm 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 not interested in that. I do it badly, and other people are much better at scaling stuff up. I'm the I'm more of the inventor, the creator, coming up with new stuff. So I got a little bored doing the same management theater row talks, the same management theater row workshops. It was new for many people in the world, but for me, it wasn't new anymore. So I just wanted to experiment, and that's what I've been doing for the last three, four, five years now. Uh, many things failed, some things succeeded, and that's the way it is as an entrepreneur. You have to try things out. Um, and uh, what I'm working on now um, could be seen as an extension of Management 3.0, which I call that the unfixed model for organization design. Uh, it fits perfectly with Management Theory Row. Actually, I say Management Theory Row at the time as sort of a weakness in organization design. I didn't really know how to draw structures of companies, uh, but now I do. And uh, I see that as an extension to what I have done before with Management Theory Row. Awesome. Um, regarding management 3.0, um, I think the process of being a facilitator changed and now it's easier, right? And also before the certification took uh, uh, to pass an exam or has it always been uh, just with the assistance? And what's the logic behind this? Why not put an exam over there to get the certification? I'm sorry, you shouldn't ask me because I'm not on the team. I have not worked on the team for several years, so I don't know the current rules. Uh, I don't know the logic uh, behind it. Uh, so uh, please, <laughs> I refer to the team members for such uh, detailed questions. Got it. No worries. Um, Jurgen, uh, do you think that the reason for the high attrition that many companies are facing right now is it has to do with this uh, happy melee uh, theory, like they don't find their their happy place and they need to keep jumping and experimenting. Is, is that a, a reason? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, there is something going on, particularly in the US, which they call the great resignation, which maybe you have heard of. Um, I think it's to a lesser extent also happening in other places in the world that more people are quitting their jobs. Um, and maybe part of it is uh, caused by um, uh, the COVID times, the last two years, where people have learned to work from home. Uh, they found out that remote working is actually not that bad, <laughs> um, that there are benefits to being autonomous uh, with your time and being to ma being able to manage your own uh, uh, work times versus your free time. Um, and um, people don't want to go back to the standard boring office anymore, or at least they demand from employers that they can have a hybrid working situation where part of the week they work from home or at the coffee bars or whatever, another part of the week they work from, from the office. Um, in case they have an office. Um, many uh, people do not work in an office, they work at stores or something where, of course, you have to show up to the workplace. Um, but um, still, I think that this has sort of increased the awareness among people that there are other ways of getting your job done. And as I always say, uh, work is not a place where we go, work is something that we do. So uh, I am, for example, I have been annoyed several times in the last few months 
where companies say uh, where companies talk about a back to work program as if people have not been working in the last two years that's a bit that's a bit weird <laughs> of course they have been working why do you call it back to work they have not been sleeping or watching netflix for two years <clears throat> they have been working from home so work is something that we do is not a place where we go um so yes the 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 demands of employees have gone up and and i think that's a good thing i think it's good that that people found out that there are other ways of getting their stuff done. Um, me, for example, I love uh, leaving my house in the morning. I have a favorite coffee bar uh, here in, in Rotterdam. I go there for several hours with my notebook until my battery is empty <laughs> just <laughs> before lunch. Usually it's a good time. <laughs> and then I go back and I have lunch uh, and I do the rest of the afternoon in my home office so um, i try to find different places to get my stuff done and when i'm traveling i will be working in hotels and at coffee bars and airports uh, etc and conference centers and i enjoy that i i enjoy being able to do my work from from anywhere so yeah it's a good thing people have increased awareness that 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 there's other ways to get their stuff done and they say to their employers um give us give us more autonomy give us hybrid working give us give us remote working or or don't don't take it away from us <laughs> basically got it thank you um so you're going i'm a i'm 40 years old i'm a manager in the company where i work i have a a, a team of 23 persons that report to me you could say like that um between scrum masters and agile coaches right and uh, I try to empower the team. I try to not take decisions without talking to everyone and take decisions together. I try to look at myself as a leader and not as a manager so much. I try to coach them and support them and be there just to remove blockers, to try to uh, help them with the work. Uh, so I'm in that sweet spot. I would call it sweet spot maybe between the old manager and trying to be a, a, a new uh, a manager with new uh, you know, this new philosophy that you uh, predict. Um, what what should I, what can you uh, give me as a tip or advice to be a great manager? Or should I just well, disappear management? <laughs> no, um, I think um, um, uh, I, I, I use the metaphor of the gardener in, in mm -hmm. my first book um, where you're responsible for the garden uh to make the the the, the uh, nutrients available in the soil make sure that the sunlight can can reach the ground and uh, keep a fence around the garden to keep the predators out uh, mm -hmm. uh maybe a net over some of the berries or otherwise the birds are going to steal the berries and things like that so you protect your garden but you cannot do the growing for the garden it has to do the growing itself right so i i like that metaphor because it's it's an example of manage the system not the people you put up the constraints around self-organization and you say well I'm, I'm, i will protect it uh, from bad things from harm but the growth and the value it it has to it has to do that them uh, it, itself that self-organizing group of people and of course it would be nice if there's coaching and support um, you could compare that with some of the plants and trees they have these little sticks to help them grow in the right direction perhaps that's the kind of role that you have as a as a um, maybe as a manager or leader that you support them a little bit so that growth is easier for them um, but that is as much as you can do and um, uh, Nowadays, I, um, uh, with my new work on, on uh, as I said, uh, uh, Unfix is, is, my, is my new work on organization design. I call them the chiefs of the governance crew. So in any units, a self-organizing units, where you have different teams or crews that self-organize and maybe do dynamic reteaming in a spontaneous way, there needs to be a boundary around it and there needs to be a crew there, a governance crew, uh, 
the chiefs that are the managers. And they are the managers who decide uh, who is in, who is out, how much do people get paid. Um, and uh, that's the main job of, of the managers of uh, what I call the base. That's the, 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 uh, that between, I don't know, a few to maximum 150 people, perhaps the group of people that, that everyone wants to belong to. And by the way, that is something that I find is missing in some of the uh, agile frameworks and other methods out there. They focus only on product development, uh, whether it is scaled agile framework or less or, or whatever, uh, disciplined, agile, you name it. Um, it's all lots of good stuff, lots of good suggestions for process, but they forget about why do people want to work here in the first place? Why, why, why do they want to hang out with, with others at this company? That is the sense of belonging, the sense of a tribe, they call that in the Spotify model. And I, that's one thing I like about the Spotify model, that they have this tribe concept. These are my people, <laughs> basically, that you're talking about. And the tribe, I call it the base, because that is your home, basically. The tribe uh, makes sure that there's, uh, well, that there's compensation, but there's also a sense of recognition that you are rewarded for, uh, for, for your accomplishments and that you are appreciated and that your main human motivators are addressed. And that ties into moving motivators of Manager 3 of course. So curiosity and honor and accomplishment, uh, uh, et cetera. So the, 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 I think the main job of the, man the manager, which is the manager of the base of, of, that, of that tribe, is making sure that people love working there. That's your job as the manager. And if someone goes away, it's your fault. Because <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't keep them. <laughs> And actually, I, I, I heard an interesting podcast uh, just, uh, just earlier today when I was walking to my coffee bar <laughs> this, uh, this morning. I tend to listen to podcasts when I, when I walk through the city. And it was a Freakonomics episode uh, called Why Are There So Many Bad Bosses? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, they said that it is very hard to measure the effectiveness of good managers. Basically, there's almost no research that that can measure what the effectiveness is of managers but they found one exception they have been able to measure that with good managers fewer people quit their jobs there's a very clear correlation there so that is i think maybe one of the most important reasons for having good managers is making sure you keep the good people that they don't go away because <laughs> if someone else just pays them more maybe they go elsewhere and uh, yeah that's that's the main job why do people love working there at your at your unit at your base your tribe whatever you want to call it i don't care and and make sure that they don't want to go away and uh, i am happy and and uh, still a little proud that a long time ago I was able to make uh, uh, um, uh, retention uh, go up to 100% for the engineers in my part of the company. While it was much lower, they were quitting and many, they were not very happy. But I introduced agile thinking, we organized, we introduced self-organizing teams, they became responsible for their own agendas, etc. And it was much more interesting, much more fun to work at, at the company then. And that was my responsibility as the manager, making sure that the self-organization happened, that it was successful and that people didn't leave. So I, maybe that's number, job number one for the manager. Keep your good people. Got it. <clears throat> awesome. Um, Jurgen, could you mention where can we apply the Unfix model? I mean, we're doing a crappy version of SAFE, or I don't know, do you have some examples where to apply it? Yeah, so um, the Unfix model is, it actually, it only focuses on organization design. 
So to give you a very brief uh, over overview, there's the base, which is your sense of belonging. That's up to 150 people because uh, Dunbar's number uh, says that we can have trusting relationships with probably no more than 150 people. The human brain is not equipped to trust 10,000 people. It's impossible for us. <laughs> we can only trust a small number of people around us. So that's what that's what that number is about. The famous number 150. You should have a take it with a grain of salt because it could be 100, could be 200, but that's a, a good number to think of. Um, and then within that base, you would have self-organizing teams. I call them crews. They create value, so value stream crews. But then there are also probably some different ones, like the facilitation crew. Uh, that will be typical agile coaches. They facilitate the others so that they have it easier to to uh, uh, to produce value. Or there could be a capability crew of just a few people with a special talent, maybe cybersecurity experts, or maybe maybe top-rated animators or data analysts that are very expensive. You have only a few of them, but you have many more teams, so they form their own little unit. And then there's platform teams that offer architecture and infrastructure, uh, maybe DevOps services to the other teams. Uh, so these are different kinds of teams. And this is inspired by team topologies, by the way. The book by Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pais is that they have a really good book, Team Topologies, that I recommend. And uh, I offer more. The governance crew is the management team. Uh, uh, that is a special place for the managers to go. Maybe there's just one, maybe there are two. That depends on the size of, of the base or the tribe. Um, and uh, the last two elements are an experience crew, which monitors the customer journey, which is bigger than just the product manager. Everything that the customer experiences from, from onboarding to invoicing and customer support, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is part of the customer experience. The experience crew should be monitoring that. And then on the other side with suppliers, you could have the same thing that you monitor the, the experience of suppliers and freelancers and vendors. I call that the acquisition crew. So these are the elements, and it's a bit like Lego. Um, I'm sure you know about Lego, Hector. <laughs> Many people in the Agile community do. Uh, it's great to work with Lego blocks. I was a big fan of Lego when I was young. I played with my Lego blocks, and I created the Unfix model as sort of a, a box of Lego blocks. You can put them together in different ways. And now we get to your question, how can you how can you use that? Well, I have a Miro template um, that people can use. Uh, it is part of the community. People can sign up for free and then they can download the Miro template and then just start drawing, start experimenting and put the blocks together and think, hmm, maybe we need a platform crew. Maybe we could use three or four value stream crews, uh, maybe a facilitation crew of coaches or maybe product managers, and then just begin and draw and, and imagine what a, a, a unit, a base could, could look like. So the first step is just to envision possible futures. Um, that is, I think, the first step for people. What, what could things look like? Uh, and then once you have a couple of different scenarios, it's a bit like scenario planning in, in strategy. You should think of different possible futures because the world is unpredictable. So this could happen and that could happen. So imagine different futures. And then when you've done that, you'll probably see, well, no matter which future is going to happen, in every case, we will have to get rid of this functional department and maybe replace it with a forum, a, a guild. Uh, a functional guild. So, okay, that's maybe the first thing that we're going to work on. How can we change that department into a guild, or as I call it, a forum? Because no matter which direction the company goes, 
this is always going to be necessary and then you will gain experience um with with your organizational changes um so i think that is the way to do it and then once you have some experience with one base you can start making others and what i like about the lego uh metaphor is that every base every tribe is different it, it depends because because we have learned from from um, organization design uh, that uh, form follows function you need to know what the tribe is for what kind of product what kind of service it is trying to offer and that tells you what structure you're going to need on the inside uh, you may also have heard of conway's law uh, which says that, that the structure you have on the inside of the organization, you will see that in the product that you offer to customers. The, the, it, it is a reflection of, of the internal structure. So if you want, if you want that organization to, to offer something different, a different kind of product with a different architecture, you will, ha you will need a different team structure on the inside. Uh, otherwise it won't, it won't be able to make that kind of product. So yeah, that's that's what Unfix is about. Um, trying to be as flexible as possible with with the uh, with organization design, and I only focus on on the structure of the organization. I I don't talk about processes because Safe already does that. Less has good suggestions, and then there's so much good advice in the agile community I, I don't want to do that all over again makes no sense but i do think that the agile frameworks are a bit weak in organization design they intentionally for example do not touch um the, the management they often say like in safe and in less they say well we don't have to change any management relationships you can just introduce less and you can just introduce safe without changing reporting relationships. Well, if you do that, then you might end up with anti-patterns like a product manager being the line manager of product owners or something like that, which is very much not recommended. Or you could have a manager on your own, on your own value team where one is managing and, and deciding on the salaries of, of the others. That's also not recommended. So I say you need to address the management issue. Uh, you need to understand management reporting, direct reports, and actually everyone in the base, uh, all the, the managers, they all are in the governance crew and nowhere else. So that is one of the <clears throat> one of the restrictions of of, of my model, uh, and um, and I want to go beyond software because let's be honest, uh, all those agile frameworks they always assume software development, <laughs> uh, basically, and there are many organizations out there that don't do software at all. There are very different kinds of businesses, but still they want to be more agile. Still they want to be more innovative, and they want to figure out how can we change our organization design uh, without having to talk about software development and i want to help those companies as well awesome yeah I, i'm with you with the management thing uh theory because uh, i have seen implementations uh with scrum where you have managers all over the place attending the dailies attending the retrospective e even and it, it, it's really bad right it's a very bad practice so taking care of management is important uh jürgen I see that the approach that you're taking, putting the managers, uh, and I can uh, uh, think about the, the garden, right? You're outside the garden, you set everything up so the, the, the flowers grow, and the, but then there's always uh, one flower that doesn't want to grow. Even if you put everything in place, there's, I have seen that, right? You have seen it. Um, if you're outside of the garden, just looking at, wouldn't you miss that flower that is not, or or should the team take care of helping him, or how do do we treat this? Well, um, uh, that's a, a very good topic. Uh, I have fired people in the past. Um, it happens every now and then that you need to 
uh, uh, need to realize that maybe uh, I was responsible for hiring the wrong person, maybe, and it turned out to be a mistake. And well, then I am also responsible for firing that person or offering them a place somewhere else in the organization. But sometimes we we didn't have such a place, uh, so we had to part uh, ways. Um, yeah, that is something that you need to do, but not before you have received 360 feedback. So now, of course, the metaphor fails here because plans don't talk about each other. <laughs> um, but uh, that is something that you need to do as a manager. You need to get everyone's opinion on how is it to work with this person. Because uh, um, um, from, from complexity science and systems thinking, we know that uh, it is uh, that the performance is in the relationships between the parts. It is not in the individual parts themselves. Actually, Google has validated this with a lot of research and data on their own teams, where they found that even mediocre or average performers can make a great team together because it is in the relationships between them where they help each other out and support each other that you get great team performance. So simply adding five top performers together on one team does not mean that you get a great performing team. Um, so this has already been established. And so it means that just because someone has average performance doesn't mean that you should fire them. <laughs> because uh, maybe their position on the team is very beneficial for that team and the others appreciate that person because maybe that person is a is like a catalyzer for the interaction of the others for example that some people have have had these situations where they thought well I'm not really sure what this person is doing here but Whenever she is available, she's around, stuff just moves better. <laughs> the other people do great, better job because she is around. She just helps the, everyone else. Uh, that, that's, that's possible. So you need to get input and, and feedback from, through 360 reviews, uh, uh, through one-on-ones, uh, whatever practice you use uh, on, on how do the other parts feel about each other basically and if you get feedback that multiple people say well i don't really know what that person is doing here or it's even it even hurts my performance when he or she is around then you have a problem because then this person is destroying the performance of the other people this can sometimes this happens with someone who has great performance so they are the prima donnas uh, they, 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 they want the best kind of work and they, they, uh, they destroy basically the motivation of the other team members. Then I, some, I say that you need to remove those because even though their performance is good, they pull everyone else down. And that's, that's not what you want. If you take that person, that toxic person out of the team, the performance of the others goes up. Uh, so you need to know, uh, you need to ask the plants what they think of the other flowers <laughs> around them, basically. That's what you need to do as a gardener. And then only when you have that feedback uh, 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 evaluated, then you can decide whether to take someone uh, to another place in the organization or just decide not to renew their contract. Got it. Okay. Uh, Jürgen, I have had people in the channel that think that Scrum is really good, others think that Scrum is really bad, and uh, most of the persons uh, don't agree on safe, right? There are persons that love safe and others that hate safe. They think that they are evil and they destroy the agility in a company. One of them was Marty Kagan. I'm sure you know him. Uh, he was here and, and he said that, and, and it was shocking for many of the persons looking at the channel, right? What's your opinion around Scrum? Do you like it? And what's your opinion around safe? Well, to start with the first one, um, I have uh, I have always been uh, an admirer of of uh, of what Scrum has achieved in the agile community. I know it it has its it has its minor flaws, but I think it's a great starting point for 
or many in the Agile who, who come to the Agile world um, and much better than what people did before. So for me, in that sense, the glass is half full, not half empty. I do see that we have moved beyond. Um, I spoke with a unicorn company uh, recently. I wrote a case study about pipe drive in, in Tallinn. And they said they moved from Scrum to Kanban because for them, Scrum was too slow. And they said okay. it's a super high performance company and they release many times per day. And they did not want to wait for weekly things to happen on a, on a weekly cadence. Things moved fa faster than that. So most of their teams use Kanban so they can have a continuous flow of stuff. And that makes, for me, makes a lot of sense. It doesn't mean that Scrum is bad. It just means that for them, Kanban is a, is a better fit. So Scrum, good, but depends on context. Uh, there are alternatives. Safe is a different matter. <laughs> Um, SAFE has many flaws. Um, I have, um, I still see it as a, a, a toolbox of lots of good ideas that they borrowed from many sources, which is a good thing that they do. The problem is that the toolbox has become very large. The picture has become very big and uh, there is no cohesion anymore, basically, uh, in, in that entire model. It has become far too complicated uh, for most people out, out there. And then the problem that you get, and we had the same thing in the 90s with the Rational Unified process, uh, was it was presented as something big, and of course they, they told everyone, um, you're not expected to do all of all of what you see here in the picture. Just use the stuff that you want. But as I described in my first book, Management Theory Row, when people are uncertain, they don't know what to do and what not to do. So they have a tendency of doing everything because they fear that maybe they miss something essential. So there is a tendency of organization to just embrace everything that 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 the the safe essential model basically offers while you should just cherry pick uh, individual practices as far as i'm concerned so that's one thing that has gone wrong in my opinion with uh, with safe and then um there are a number of anti-patterns uh in 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 the safe uh, framework um one of my uh well, I cannot say favorite because I don't like it. <laughs> but my favorite example is a picture on the safe website that shows uh, a product manager between a customer and a product owner and then the team. So you have team, product owner, product manager, customer. That's two people between the team and the customer. That's an anti-pattern. Yeah. That's that's two handovers <laughs> that are taking place. Um, at least that's how the picture shows it. Uh, and also uh, having a, the product manager as someone who is more important than the product owners is also an anti-pattern. And this is the kind of behavior that um, is maybe unintentional uh, because I spoke with uh, an expert on safe, safe professional, and he said this is this is not intended. This is just a bad picture that someone made, and indeed this is badly implemented. But that's how things go when you have lots of people working on a framework. Some of them make bad pictures, and then this picture is being used by companies that don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a problem, I think, with with safe that it is not cohesive. There are anti patterns uh, there of wrong advice, basically. So I I am not a I'm not a big fan. But I think these problems can be fixed with smart people who know what they're doing. I'm pretty sure there are some very smart, um, uh, safe consultants out there who are doing a good job. So I'm not trying to discredit everything, but. When I look at the website and I read some pages, I think, oh, oh my God, <laughs> that doesn't really look look good, uh, in in my opinion. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, Jürgen, let's say that I have a company. I have some teams, probably a startup or a mid-sized company, a little bigger than a startup. And I see that there's a lot of command and control. I see there's not very empowered teams. There's not a, a good time to market or to money. And I call Jürgen, right? Jürgen, help me with here. We have an issue. We need a transformation. How how would you approach the the, the transformation? Like uh, the, the I, I I think that you have done probably this. I don't know if this is part of what you do normally. No, you don't you don't consult for companies. No, no okay. I don't do that. <laughs> well, well I, I still would like to hear your your opinion. What do you think? How would you start? Like what would you the uh, how would what would be the advice right for this company or the steps to yeah. have a transformation? Right. So um, I get that question every day. <laughs> Literally, I got it. I got it yesterday. I got it before the day before. It's a very common question. Where, where do we start? But my answer is, um, if you um, is like asking me, uh, I want to I want to redesign my house. Where do I start? Well, I have no idea what your house looks like. <laughs> it really depends on your house um uh, so we have to walk through your house and i need to understand the entire house before i can even offer advice that that makes any sense but in general that being said um i i like thinking of the uh, the famous uh, innovation adoption curve uh by rogers uh who said that any change goes through uh, stages of innovators early adopters early majority uh late majority and then the laggards and uh you need to begin with the innovators and the early adopters who are the most enthusiastic people that's where the change begins and it could be that the ceo is the most enthusiastic person it could also be that the hr person is the most enthusiastic or maybe a couple of engineers on some of the teams are the ones who want to try things out that's your starting point uh, so it could start anywhere in the organization the 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 the, the the guiding principle is begin with the innovators, those who say, okay, let's roll up our sleeves. We, we, we love introducing something new. We like experimenting with new ideas. And then you have to get them on board, um, maybe organize um, uh, an informal community of practice uh, with each other that you could call the uh, uh, the, the the beginnings of an agile transformation community or something where they talk and inspire each other and begin with the lowest hanging fruit or what are the simplest things that we could change that could have an impact on how people behave and um, that does not necessarily have to be anything related to to process uh or or team structure it could be very simple things like okay um what what uh, uh what kind of equipment do we have what kind of tools do we use that enable us to communicate better with each other because everything depends on communication and while the agile manifesto says individuals in interactions over processes and tools that is all very well but we need tools in order to communicate among each other as individuals and interactions. I mean, we now use the English language for communication. That's a tool. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're using uh, Restream Studio. That's a tool. Otherwise, we cannot have this conversation. So we need to figure out which, which tools, which infrastructure is going to help us have more transparent, open conversation with each other. Maybe that's a starting point. It, it could be. You can start anywhere. Um, but <clears throat> find the innovators in the <clears throat> excuse me, find the innovators in the organization and, and get them together, uh, form an informal guild or 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 uh, forum as as I call it, and uh, yeah, um, let them start uh, thinking and experimenting with uh, simple things that uh, don't scare anyone else yet <laughs> the, the simplest things the low-hanging fruit you can always do the difficult things later on but 
you want to show early success, as they say in change management. Uh, small steps, show the early wins, mm -hmm. and then you will get other people interested, uh, and then you can, uh, you will have more people on board, and then you can start tackling the somewhat more complicated things. Like moving a manager around is not something you could do probably on the first day because <laughs> this is about territory this is about power and influence uh, that's not an easy thing not an easy starting point uh, but uh, other things uh, like swapping one communication tool for another because another is is easier to use that could be could be simpler i don't know it depends on what you're doing got it okay um, Jürgen, the biggest or some of the biggest myths that you see around Agile? What are some of the biggest myths? Yeah. Um, gosh, oh, I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Um, uh, or anti-patterns that you have seen? Well, yeah, no, it's, um, there is one that is, um, um, that is, that I find very important. I think one big myth is that agile is all about uh, producing stuff faster uh, about about delivering value sooner to the customer um, this is not true it really depends on what kind of product or or uh, service you are offering to the customer what is important is the experience and this is actually a topic that is dear to my heart um, uh, that is um, uh, is uh, uh, something that <clears throat> the Agile community should think about. I, I, I offer as an example um, uh, in several of my keynotes that I had this really good app on my phone for uh, grocery shopping. Uh, you know those kinds of apps. You find the bread and everything and you order it and then sometimes later someone comes to your door and delivers it there's a couple of these companies in in, in my country mm -hmm. so i made orders and uh, the the company that i used um focused uh, uh, on uh, not so much on 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 speed uh, of delivery <clears throat> but they focus on uh, sustainability and 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 uh, low inventory uh, etc which is good uh, not throwing vegetables away when they were not being used, etc. So I did not care about things being delivered to me faster. But with with ten orders that I placed, it happened three times that one thing was missing. That I got a message one hour before delivery, and it said, "Sorry, uh, we have no yogurt." And then I had no yogurt. And then I had to go to the supermarket uh, around the corner to get the yogurt. Well, if I go to the supermarket, I just I can just as well get everything at the supermarket. Yeah. I don't need to use it's an app. Useless. The app is useless. And the app is useless, yes. So the experience here for me was that things were missing in my order. I didn't care mm -hmm. that it took three days to deliver it. I care that in three days they were not able to find yogurt which is ridiculous because it's i can find it in five minutes uh, from my house so the the problem i think in the agile community at large is that there's far too much uh, focus on we have to deliver stuff faster no i don't care often about getting stuff faster um, look at, at um, a very different kind of product, Netflix TV series. I am looking forward to the last season of Peaky Blinders because I have watched the first five seasons. Have you seen it, Hector? I have started seeing it just like last week. I have All right, four okay. or five. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So um, I look forward to seeing it. And actually, that is part of the experience is that we look forward to the new season. We don't necessarily want the new season to be delivered faster because that sort of destroys mm. our enjoyment of the anticipation of the next season. All right, it's almost there. And sometimes we have to wait quite a long time in order to get the next thing. Actually, in games, they even have a name for that. They call it a torture brick. That <laughs> is a gamification technique. You literally torture your customers by making them wait 
that has a psychological effect of us enjoying the product even more when we finally get it. So the experience, it can be positive if we make people wait for something because then the enjoyment is larger. And they do, it, they do that intentional in TV series, for example, when there's a cliffhanger at the end of a season. And my God, we have to wait several months or maybe a year for the new season to arrive. And then finally, the cliffhanger is resolved. That is experience. Nobody asks for the new season faster because that destroys the experience. Now, we, we have been raised with the idea of software development features that people want faster. And very often that is true, that we can deliver the value to our customers faster when we get the features out of the door. But that is not what agility should be about, just delivering stuff faster. We should optimize the value, the experience for our customers. And sometimes making them wait is fine, as long as we don't forget the yogurt, because <laughs> then they will be annoyed, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, and then the whole beautiful app is going to be useless because they're going to delete it from their phone, as I did, because I was so angry the third time that I thought, okay, I'll from now, I will just walk to the supermarket because this app is, is useless for me. Got it, thank you. Um, Jürgen, if you had to give a book as a present, which book would you give? Oh, gosh, I wish I kn had known that question uh, earlier so I could have a look at my Goodreads uh, account and, and see which books I, I've given five stars. Um, um, but uh, recent books that I read, uh, one is uh, Dynamic Reteaming by Heidi Alphand. Uh, she writes about the idea that, and I agree with that, that there is value in um, allowing people to move around from team to team uh, because that is helpful for their uh, personal development. It is. Um, it is good for uh, organizational agility, uh, for knowledge to spread around. And there are some companies doing this in, in a more ritualized fashion. They have reteaming events every year or every few months, or in some cases, even every sprint, where people flock towards the goals that they want to work on, like in an open space kind of way. So every sprint there or every goal, there is a new combination of people working on that. That's a different way of, of looking at, at teams. And I find that super, super inspiring. Uh, and I see more and more examples of dynamic reteaming uh, around me. So if there's one book I can recommend right now, yeah, it's look into dynamic reteaming. Uh, Heidi wrote an entire book about it. Uh, I have included it as as a, a fundamental concept in in unfix uh, my uh, my model i'm not saying that everyone should do dynamic reteaming but um as i always say uh, for the last 15 years uh, we have we have often said in the agile community um, don't change your teams because if you change your teams, you will destroy their velocity and you will destroy their throughput. It will be painful, but that is sub-optimization still. You're creating a silo. It is a horizontal silo instead of a vertical silo. And we're not trying to optimize individual teams. We're trying to optimize the entire uh, 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 business. And uh, uh, it, it is okay for velocity of a team, maybe to drop a little, uh, if you allow people to have a greater employee experience and allow them to move around, because then the net effect for the whole organization is positive. As they, find, as they found out at Redgate Software, for example, they have blog posts about their dynamic reteaming and people love being able to choose different teams every now and then and the, the impact on velocity is not very big and the, the benefits outweigh the the drawbacks so i think we need to learn how to do this better 
uh, and um, I always refer to the famous, uh, the, the, the favorite quote of Martin Fowler, who said that if it hurts, do it more often. And uh, he, uh, he, he used that quote for uh, releases, right? The, the software releases. And then when that has resulted in continuous deployment, ultimately, we have, we have learned to deploy software more and more often and make it painless. Well, I think we can apply the same principle to reteaming, figure out how to make reteaming less painful, maybe even painless because there are benefits of being able of being or allowing people to move around to the goals and the objectives where they would love to contribute where they think that they can learn the most and uh, and the benefits well we get back to the earlier topic uh, the benefits for the organization is that people will not quit their jobs anymore because they see they can they can work on their skills in lots of different areas and they're not stuck on the same team uh, and anymore so that's uh, that's my recommendation awesome thank you um jurgen this is a kind of a weird question but if you had the chance to put a billboard i don't know if that's how we call it like a spectacular like these big signs in the streets if you had to put over there and you had like 1000 all over the world right for you and you had to put over there a message or a phrase to tell to the world what would you like them to read every day when they go to work or whatever right? mm, i would say try something just try something try something. run an experiment okay <laughs> run experiments uh, cheap safe and fast because we want the experiments to be cheap we want fast results so that we learn and we don't want to blow things up <laughs> uh so the experiments need to be safe so run experiments cheap safe and fast or summarize it as try something in big letters try something today something you've never done before that's awesome that's that's great um jurgen uh i'm trying to represent over here the questions that i think that many scrum masters agile coaches developers have for you but if i didn't do a good job um and you were in my place what do you think that you would ask Jurgen to provide some value to them, like to Scrum teams? Uh, you know, any question that I forgot to tell you? Oh, that's an interesting meta question. Um, well, um, I would ask me, uh, and this has been asked before by some people, uh, where are things going? Um, because Agile is 21 years old now. And people are wondering, okay, um, on the one on the one hand, um, Agile is getting a bad rap in some organizations. Uh, people have been disappointed uh, with uh, the results achieved so far. On the other hand, uh, there's no way going back. Uh, it is uh, it is expected of organizations to be more agile. So maybe the term itself will go away. And that's fine. I don't care about the word itself, as long as companies try to be more innovative and, and have more business agility, that's fine with me. But where is it going? Um, uh, I think the experience, the human experience, uh, which consists of customer experience and employee experience, uh, those are two components of that. I think that's going to be uh, more and more important. We live nowadays in the experience economy, as some people say. And we made this step from projects to products, which is good. That's a good step that we made in the software community. But I think we're making, or we should be making the next step from product to experience. And I gave you that example of the supermarket. Uh, the app was great, good product. I threw it away because it was not about the product. It was about my experience. As I always say, I don't care about your product. I care about my experience. Uh, that is most important. So you need to understand what is the experience here that customers are having with our company and what can we do through our products and our services and all the touch points that customers have with us to have a better experience for for our clients so a move and that also applies to the human experience inside so the employee experience and we talked about that of keeping people having them not quit their jobs 
um, so the human experience uh, uh, is is I think the next thing and actually there's a the employee experience ex and the customer experience cx are big topics nowadays they even have their own acronyms <laughs> uh, and uh, so at some point we have to forget about products we talk about products all the time product owner product manager product backlog product roadmap yada yada yada, yada. we're still very stuck very much stuck in product thinking in the agile community um i, I plan to flag on the horizon and say next step forward is experience what is the end result how did the how was the customer happier today because of what you did with your company through your product or through your service or, or through an email that you sent them i don't care that is that is experience awesome uh one last question um talking about what's coming in the future you have i'm sure that you have seen how the the people nowadays are a lot more sensible. Like uh, I saw some of your videos before, like nine years ago or 10, and we could say jokes, right? About fat people or or whatever. And now it's it looks like you we cannot do any jokes because someone will get hurt, right? So this extra sensibility, do you think that that is driving the way we work, the way we interact, the way the employee world is driven by this? Do you think that that will only get uh, more sensible the new generations or do you think that at some point we will get back uh, like in circles or something no i think in general it's a good thing that we that the world has become more uh, more respectful uh in to some extent uh towards people uh, who do not fit the standard picture <laughs> mm -hmm. um and uh, and that's a good thing we are more curious and open-minded across the world diversity and inclusion are are big topic topics nowadays mm -hmm. on the other hand um i i am someone who is against uh certain forms of cancel culture where you're basically not allowed to say anything anymore these days yeah. uh, without being punished uh, sometimes it goes too far but i think that is part of growing up as as a society we have to figure out okay what is what is acceptable and what is not how should we protect people from being bullied and 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 being hurt by others and to what extent should we say hey you're adults grow up don't take everything so personally um and those are those are two sides and i think that's a good conversation to have and there's not a clear line uh, between the two so um yeah those are good conversations to have i think there is more maturity now in the world um but um and i don't i, I think it's uh it's not a straight line up it's like two steps forward one step back uh so overall progress goes up but it's not always in a straight line um, as we see uh in the geopolitical sense there are bad things happening in the world right now um and uh, that's also part of the world growing up uh, it is two steps forward one step back and sometimes bad things happen because uh for some people progress went uh, too fast and they 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 pull the whole world back basically for a moment but they cannot do that for long in in, in my opinion uh, so yeah that's um, that's my philosophical contribution <laughs> yeah I, I agree with you and yeah they should learn faster they, they don't catch up with uh how the world works right now they still yeah. belong to the past this this thing happening over here right now it's incredible right yeah, um exactly. jürgen thank you for all the the the, the time uh it's one hour and i want to be respectful respectful of your time so if the persons looking at you right now want to keep in touch with you and want to follow you on social networks i will put on the comments uh all your your uh links but uh which one do right. you prefer how how do you like to be approached or ask questions or well, I would love for people to join me uh, uh, with my new um, uh, efforts on Unfix, uh, which is unfix.work. So you can add that to the links because uh, there's a community there. People can sign up. They can download the templates and uh, uh, 
the PDFs, etc., to play with organization design. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where I like having conversations with uh, with people about their challenges in their organization, and maybe we can talk about that with some of your uh, some of your listeners and viewers. Okay, awesome. So I hope that at some point we can have you back and probably talk uh, specifically about the Unfix or any other mm -hmm. topics you want to address. I really appreciate your time today, and I truly uh, congratulate you. Uh, because of the work that you do, I really believe that you're making uh, the companies and the environments, the working environments, a better place. And that's really nice. So I, I really, uh, in the name of everyone looking, I can say thank you uh, for thank that. You. So um, talk Appreciate to you soon. That. And thanks a lot for your time, Jurgen. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Hector. It was great. Thanks. Bye, man. Jurgen Apello, people. Um, Thank you. If you come up to here, thanks for watching the video. Please give a like, subscribe. We will uh, leave some links in the comments and in the information of the video so you can keep in contact or, or look at what uh, Jurgen is planning and the Unfix model. So thanks a lot and talk to you soon in the next one.